thinking around uh, credentials. And so what do we mean by that? Well, when we talk about credentials, or specifically in this case, we're talking about micro-credentialing, which is how do we begin to change how learning is recognized? Number two, how do we begin to recognize learning in all of its forms? So if we think about the learning environment, there are a lot of different ways that, that students engage learning. One is, is in the most obvious being curricular, so this is the courses that they take, uh, but also that would be to include co-curricular activities, uh, so things they do outside of the classroom. Um, that would also be to include what we call open curricular, so this would be engagement in MOOCs or other styles of open education. Uh, and then, then the other, uh, another one being cross-curricular, so this is learning outcomes that are achieved across a collection of programs or opportunities uh, that, that can be recognized in a particular way. Um, and, and probably one of the, the most popular forms right now in terms of conversation is around the use of badges, of digital badges, uh, to recognize that learning. So in this case, what we're looking at is um, you know, the idea of a digital badge, and we're all familiar with this concept, uh, it, it derives from scouting the idea that the accomplish, an accomplishment is recognized in a very visual form. But really, the, the key thing to understand, I think, about digital badges is that really we're not talking about the visual symbol. Really what we're talking about is all the guts inside of it, all the things that, that make up that badge. Uh, which is, and the key part of that is really looking at you know, evidence, evidence of learning, um, such that the credential itself has explicit value. Um, and with that, I'll let Rick talk a little bit about uh, credentialing in this context as well. Thanks, Carl. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting you know, topic to think about because I, you know, I, I think about it sometimes from the uh, um, employer's side. And, and how can we best um, kind of highlight learning that has been achieved by students? You know, how do we document it? And how do we get acceptance from, from kind of the corporate side? You know, um, I don't know if it's a terminology issue in terms of the idea of badges, whether, you know, um, we need to rethink of it as, as, as micro-credentials or, or, or something that resonates better with, with corporations and stuff. But I think, you know, it, it's, a, it's so intriguing because it's something that, as designers, we've looked at for years in terms of, you know, what are the learning outcomes? What are the specific things that we want students to be able to, to demonstrate in courses? So it fits so well with what we do every day. And, and it's a question of, you know, how do we package that and get buy-in? And then also, I think the other thing is, is this, um, the whole idea around prior learning assessment and how do we, how do we get both corporations and probably the academy more on board with this idea of the collection of credentials and and uh, and just in learning um, so that students don't feel like things they've done over the years have been discredited and two to help them really in a, in, in today's world of, of uh, a lot of oversight uh, by government in terms of cost uh, how do we help reduce the cost and move students through their programs quicker? Mm -hmm. So I think I think the idea is is uh, it's, it's just one that's that ripe sure. <laughs> for yeah. us to to move forward with. Um, but I think it's 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 some, some time. I know um, Kyle Peck's uh, you know been out there a lot talking about this and and really talking about the idea that grades being this point in time sort of measure don't really tell us much about what the student's capable of doing. So, mm -hmm. um, And you, you make an excellent point there around you know, kind of the opportunities of, of credentials in this space, especially from an instructional design standpoint, because what it does is it gives us a new way to think about how instruction is delivered um, in, in such that we can create uh, paths for learning paths for the students that, that are really kind of a choose your own adventure for learning, where they can self-select what really applies to them. And there's a lot of research that goes around, you know, these kinds of self-directed learning opportunities can really increase motivation for students. And that's an area that's really worthy of exploration. Uh, but certainly it leads to kind of the, the, how does that fit into those environments or the course environments? Because really what happens now is that it's, it, it, the, the learning experience happens on a course clock, which is it's a, a 15 week or 16 week cycle. And it's a race for the student to see, can they accomplish a certain amount in that amount of time. 
But in reality, we should be looking at it differently around, rather than saying, okay, you've reached the 15-week mark and you're at a, let's say, C level, it shouldn't necessarily be that way. It should look at it more from a standpoint of, okay, you are currently at a C level and here's what it takes to get or to master the competencies from these courses. Um, and, you know, anyone who's ever taken a um, college course knows that it is possible to pass a course and not necessarily fully master all of the learning outcomes. Um, so how do we create the learning in a different way such that it is possible to focus on and master learning outcomes as we go through and then also focus on those that have the greater pl greatest apl applicability to me based on my interest, based on my career trajectory, based on the areas of need that I have. Um, so that's part of the, I think, what is the real opportunity around credentials is that they can begin to change how learning is even delivered and how it's designed um, in that context. Well, I think, you know, the idea that in terms of the curriculum, too, is, is as we look at the new um, uh, general education portfolio and rethinking it in terms of themes and stuff, you know, how, how great it is to think about credentials at this level and what that may look like. I'm probably, if people are joining in out there, they're probably like going, no. <laughs> well, but, the Senate is kind of up in the air right now, too. So, so themes. yeah. So it'd be interesting, but you know, to see how, how that may play out. And, and if, like you said, we can have different paths through the learning that still get students can follow different paths, but at the end we can say that they've accomplished what we needed them to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's important. It, it, it's important to bring into this conversation really competency-based learning as a part of that, right? So that's that is a a parallel but related um, component of learning about credentials, which is you know as students begin to, to master competencies as part of the courses in, in these competency-based. Uh, environments, the, the micro-credentialing becomes a way to begin to recognize those achievements um, as they move through there. So that, that too is a very you know, kind of related uh, aspect of this as well. Are there any questions or anything on online? I just want to, yeah. Um, how, what, what have your comments with faculty, not MOOC faculty, but faculty teaching standard semester-based courses? whether online or face-to-face, um, -face, about this idea of uh, shifting away from course grades to identifying you know, benchmarks along the way. I mean, many faculty, and it could be turned into some sort of micro-credentialing. But I'm just wondering, what has the faculty the academy buy-in, what, what are they bringing up as mm -hmm. Concerns or um, yay, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if that's happening. Um, sure. So, so do, I guess the uh, uh, do I need to repeat the question here, by the way? The um, uh, so, so to kind of unpack that a little bit, I, I think the key key issue in there is not necessarily looking at a one or the other, right? So it's not necessarily should we still be giving grades and should we do this no. instead, but rather it's looking at how does this begin to complement what we're currently doing. Um, and the example I'd like to give is around transcripts, right? So we issue and have since probably the very beginning issued to students transcripts of learning. Um, and if we look at them, really they're more a measure of seat time than they are of any indication of what was actually learned as part of that curriculum. And I always draw a correlation between if the next time you look at your transcript, compare that with a receipt that you get from Walmart or somewhere like that, right? They bear a striking resemblance in terms of, you know, here's a list of things that you have acquired, right? And so, uh, so part of it, you can look at this as an alternate way of reinforcing what the students have accomplished. And so really, I think there's a lot of complement between those two. Now, in terms of faculty reaction, I think that's the key piece of it is that in these environments, the, 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 the creative thinking is around how do we begin to use this to recognize those things that really hadn't been recognized before. Mm -hmm. And we think about that in a kind of sub-course level. So if a course has multiple learning outcomes, how do we use it to recognize learning outcomes inside of, inside of that course? Other part of it being how do we begin to uh, allow students kind of self-select based on the outcomes that, that have the greatest applicability to them. So that's really the um, kind of the opportunity around it, and really that's a big driver around those conversations with faculty on this topic, is that it is a technology that can be retrofit 
into existing learning environments. It's not a matter of saying, look, you have to stop everything you're doing and completely just redesign it to work this way, but rather you are already developing learning outcomes. You are already thinking about how are students being assessed on these topics. So the, the only real change in here is that you're beginning to recognize or codify the, how they're learning as they go through that process. And so a big part of it is, is it's still an emergent meeting medium and there's a lot to be figured out kind of as pointing out before are we really going to continue to call them badges are employers really going to be willing to accept something called a badge and that's a great question because it, it does need to kind of grow up a little bit uh, before you know we'll, we'll see widespread acceptance but at the same time I think it's opportunity and that's really the focus of our conversation with faculty has been around what is the creativity that can be applied once we have these kinds of tools in place and I think I thought your Walmart example, you were going to say the Walmart had more detail. Um, that, <laughs> that it does, yeah, the transcript has the total. But, uh, um, you know, I, it gets you, we, as you start thinking about it, and, and you start thinking, you know, is it, is it conceivable that we can have courses that have uh, multiple learning outcomes, and not every student has to meet the same learning outcomes? But there's a set of learning outcomes at a core, and then there's other, you know. Mm -hmm. So you start to get to more of a personalization sort of thing too. What does, you know, what does that look like? And now, you know, we may be talking difference between, you know, um, junior senior courses versus freshman sophomore courses. There may be differences there in how we look at some of it. But it opens up the kind of an interesting set of possibilities of how we can look at the, the courses in the future. So my my thought was that much of what are already doing, like Kyle said, could be adapted to this very easily. I mean, they have assignments, they have skills or knowledge associated with those assignments. I mean, so I see a, certainly a parallel, um, but I, I was just wondering how interested are faculty in this? So, well, I guess we'll see. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and I think the the great thing with online learning, whether it's you know been for the world campus or for online courses in residence, is it's really got faculty thinking more about learning mm -hmm. and thinking about what do I really want my students to come out with at the end, and and so I think you know over the last 10, 15 years we've kind of faculty are thinking at a different level than they used to think at in terms of learning and what's happening in their class stuff, which I think is a great thing. And it might be a more palatable way to get to that than program assessment, which is how where that driver has been in the past, yeah. mm -hmm. which is the outside accreditor, blah, blah. <clears throat> so with that, let's, uh, we can begin to move into the next topic, um, and which is really looking at, you know, how, how do we provide or how do we take advantage of these kind of live or whether they be face-to-face -face or synchronous online style of experiences, really using the technology that, um, is you know already available and out there. And these are the things that students already are kind of self-selecting for themselves and bringing with them to their learning experiences. And it takes a wide range. And the, the the most you know the most obvious and, and most common would be you know the use of, of a cell phone but that could also be to include you know tablets and laptops and then even as we begin to expand outside of that the newer technologies like Google Glass and then we're also beginning to see Oculus Rift and these kinds of things beginning to uh, proliferate uh, or beginning to, to see some interest um, how do we bring that to bear as part of the learning experience and that uh, too opens up some really interesting opportunities and one of those is around um, the idea of the second screen. And so if it, in this concept really comes from uh, television. Um, and this is it's done best, I think, by the cable networks. Uh, but what happens is that, that a, a television network realizes that they are in competition for your eyes. So it used to be that when you watched TV, you were just watching TV. Uh, and then somebody came along with laptops. And, and tablets, and then it became an area where you were basically watching TV and you would glance down at your laptop or your tablet from time to time. Well, now what we're seeing is kind of the inverse of that, where essentially you're just kind of surfing or doing something on your laptop while the TV is playing in the background and you will glance up at the TV from time to time. Um, so the real challenge in there for the, tele for, for the networks was, well, how do we be competitive in that space if we realize that we've already kind of lost their attention? 
And so what they began to do is invent what they call the second screen or second screen experiences, uh, which were mobile applications that were designed to be used in parallel with the television watching experience. So they didn't rely on it. So you could still watch the show and, and know nothing about it. But at the same time, if you had your iPad out or your, your laptop out, you could follow along with things that were going on inside of the show and get explanations of subtle plot points. You could interact with other people who are watching the show at the same time. You could find out where to buy the shirt the actor was wearing in, the, in whatever scene they were in. So it had all these interesting ways of interacting. And so if we think about learning experiences, they can very much happen the same way. So if you think about how, when instruction is being delivered, students already have their laptop out and maybe the same type of challenge is existing. Where before they were really engaged in the instruction, now there's another device that's in there. That's in, and so how do we begin to deliver another channel of information uh, on top of that lecture? And I think that's a really interesting way of thinking about you know, how we, how we engage students in live experiences and how do we extract, especially from a resident standpoint. So we have the students already here, we have them collected inside of a room, how do we extract even more out of those active learning experiences and what role does technology play in that because they're already bringing it with them. You know, that's really, I think, a, a big part of that opportunity. Well, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting, uh, you know, the scenario you've laid out is, is interesting because you know, we've read there's many, many articles over over the, the past uh, few years about um, the competing attention at, for students in classes and with all the different devices that they're coming with. And, and you know, I'm sure we've all read um, the articles of, of how students are disengaging from the lesson and going on to their devices. And so I think that the, the real key here is is understanding that that's happening and then changing how we look at the learning experience and what we're doing in the classroom and what we're doing online to, to adapt to that sort of thing. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, online it may be a little easier because we have kind of have them in a world that's a virtual world already and, and we're, there's a lot of media already in place that, that's competing, I won't say competing for their attention, but we're bringing different media to bear um, as we address different sort of content and learning outcomes and stuff. But I, I think that, to me, the intriguing thing in the classroom is, um, I keep thinking about this, is, you know, will classrooms even exist in five years? I mean, we st I mean physically they may, <laughs> but it's this question of, you know, what do we really want that experience to be for students in, when they step into a, a classroom? Is it, I can't believe we want it to continue to be the lecture sort of format. I mean, it's, it's something that's worked well since, you know, the, the early GI Bill and stuff came out of World War II and we went to the massification of higher ed and, and the large classrooms and I say it worked well and that it allowed us to address a lot of students. <laughs> I won't make a statement on whether they learned. <laughs> but um, I, I think that whole experience has to be rethought now in terms of what we want to happen in that environment. What in knowing that they're coming, I mean, I love the graphic that, that Kyle chose, with, which is kind of the bring your own device, and it's the kind of the wearable stuff. It, it uh, you know, jokingly, I thought to myself when I first looked at it, and I went, oh, I'll be able to to, to monitor student stress level during exams, um, as <laughs> if they're using the wear, if they're wearing something. But you know, beyond that, you, you know, it's not so much. It, it's I think it depicts just the variety of stuff that people are coming to the classroom with and how do we, how do we engage and motivate them through those devices in combination with what's going on in the classroom. Um, which I, I mean, I think about it, but I have no great answers at the moment. <laughs> sure. Sure. And so, you know, you know, one of the past experiences I, I had was really around implementing back channels um, or back channel discussions inside of the classroom. And especially in large enroll courses with high enrollments, you know, there's an anxiety that the students have sitting inside of that classroom. And it's really multi-layered um, in, in the sense that it's not the traditional thing that we think of, and, but which is, I'm afraid to ask a stupid question in front of all of my peers, right? And that's the one thing that most of us think about. But what we also found was that 
students had anxiety about taking up class time to ask questions because they resented it when other students did it and they didn't want to do that themselves. Uh, and then they also were, there were students who um, just generally had anxiety about presenting in front of other students, which is a slightly different challenge. And so the back channel became a way for those students to engage. So those that, that weren't um, that were introverts, that didn't really want to kind of share their, their, their thoughts openly, the DAC channel uh, gave them a way to do that. And really, it, it, it gave voice to those students that didn't feel like they had it before, which was a very compelling uh, finding. Now, the other part of that, which was very interesting, which was looking at kind of the distraction of introducing that back channel inside of the classroom. And what we found was it wasn't that it offloaded the classroom instruction or the classroom interaction to a digital environment, but rather it became a complement uh, for the physical environment. And so really what students said was is that having this back channel and understanding what other people were thinking inside of the class really enriched the kind of live experience that was going on. And so it didn't prevent anyone from kind of raising their hand and asking a question or sharing an idea, but rather allowed them to do it at a greater scale and have a better feeling for what was going on inside of the class. So those kinds of concepts can further reinforce these types of learning environments where we have a group of people kind of together, they're sharing an experience. We can look at what are the forms of, of instruction that come from that, but really what we can look at is how do we pull more value out of that or how can we engage those students in new or different ways? Um, and certainly this technology is one way to do it because by, by and large it's already there. Nobody had to ask them to bring it, they chose it um, they chose to bring it with them uh, to the classroom in, in, in an effort to kind of engage, um, whether it be inside the class or, or, or outside the class. So we have a few questions online. Um, one of them, actually from Steph here in the room, asking, thank you very much. We've been searching all over the room for the button for those shades for the last half an hour. Uh, from Steph here in the room saying it would be a great way to find a, an easy way to model this type of interaction, the, the interactions that you're talking about. Do you have any examples of how you've modeled this or taught this or, or shown others the potential for what you're speaking of? Sure. So I've, I've implemented, like I mentioned, the, the back channel model in multiple different courses before. And, and these were a wide range of courses, not in any specific discipline. Um, so we were looking, we did, we did implementations in personal finance and health and human development and, you know, in the sciences and technology. So we've done it and seen it in a broad range. And it really gets down to is how is that interaction being drawn into the instruction itself? And so having tools available for the faculty to be creative in how they use it. So I've, I've, I've seen it unfold multiple ways and it's based on the kind of teaching style of the faculty where in some cases they're, they will bring with them a teaching assistant to kind of monitor and engage in a rapid fire question and answer as part of the back channel. But then when there's that really good question that comes up, they'll kick it up to the professor and then, then he can kind of talk about that and unpack that issue right there. Um, and that, that was just based on their particular style, whereas, whereas I've seen others that will carry an iPad with them as they're talking, as they're interacting with their class, and then glance down at it from time to time and pull out a few items to talk about in front of the class. So those were just two kind of different ways of approaching the same idea. Uh, whereas some use it as a way to crowdsource ideas inside of the class. So especially if you're having, um, so this was very popular in courses that had uh, very complex issues that needed to be discussed. The, probably the, the, the most interesting was a course on human sexuality. So those students would do anything not to talk about sex openly in this class. And so having a digital back channel was a good way for them to have those conversations. Um, and, and express things that they wouldn't have otherwise said um, in, in what was it, an environment that where there was a level of anonymity, but at the same time, a level of accountability. So that and, and having the balance between the two became kind of the key critical factor in there. So all of these are aspects that, that kind of look at how do, we how do we include that? But again, these are kind of what I would say kind of next generation active learning techniques, right? When we begin to look at active learning that takes place in the classroom, how do we begin to fuel that with new technology, things that are already there, and begin to get creative about um, how can we increase those outcomes? How do we increase the live experience, enrich the live experience by having a kind of synchronous digital one? You know, that kind of idea. So those are just a few examples of, of how I've seen it been implemented. You know, you know and, and, and really, you know, what we're really looking at in terms of, of the fully online courses is 
we've really been, you know, following um, the trends of, of more and more social media being integrated into the learning management systems. Because what we're really looking for is that more seamless experience for the learners, so that even if they're in an asynchronous course, they can see who's online with them and automatically start a conversation with them um, as they're studying at, at, in the evening or, or any time. I mean, that combined with, uh, uh, you know, the other big piece is obviously the mobile piece um, for the online um, learners and, and uh, a lot to be um, discovered there. Um, uh, culturally, um, from a, from an age perspective, demographic and stuff of how people interact with their mobile devices when they're in a learning environment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, are they just looking for particular sorts of tools in terms of a quick check on on discussions or emails or what to do? You know, do they really want to engage on their mobile devices with the content? Um, and content is, I know, is a very broad term. Um, from from video to, to text to, and, and those are you know a lot of the things that we're looking at we're just really starting to, to think about that we're you know I think everybody's kind of moving towards more responsive design even though we we don't know how they're going to use it yet we want it to be available to them so that if they want to use it on on us on their phone on the iPad whatever they're using at the time um, and, and, you know, primarily we're dealing with, with adult learners or students that have characteristics of adult learners. So, um, you know, it's, we think of those characteristics and there's a lot going on in their lives, um, you know, whether they're, they're sitting at their, you know, one of their soccer games or they're, they're, you know, on a commute someplace, you know, how, how can we still provide the ability to engage in their courses while they're in these these life events that's going on at the time, and, and so those are, those are the things that we're really starting to to seriously look at and try to understand. Um, we're very hopeful in the new Blackboard pilot that we'll be able to um, uh, experiment with their their social media sort of interface that they have. Um, I think that the the challenge, is, as Kyle was talking, I was I was thinking is. I always find it interesting that we can experiment in ways in classrooms that we can't necessarily experiment online. <laughs> because all of a sudden we move online and all of a sudden we, we kinda we kind of stop and go, you know, what's what's the privacy issues here for the student that we're about to look at and stuff? And you know, do we have student rights issues that we've got to think about? And so we kind of pause for a moment before we go forward just to, to make sure that we're not, you know, exposing students somehow in a way that they don't be exposed so have you do we have any sense of who's participating I mean the adult learner thing brings up one issue when we think about BYOD in the classroom that's a whole different student population and I, I always think about diversity implications particularly socioeconomic um, issues which is a big category for us at Penn State and do low-income people have those devices that allow them to, and do we have any information about them? I know we've done surveys on, do you have a laptop? And there was a big disparity income-wise. But I'm wondering if the, the cell phones and the smartphones are bringing us to a more equitable place. Tablets, maybe not. Yeah. According, according to the, the, the Pew Foundation and their research, um, it does show a huge uptick on smartphones with other ethnic with with groups, um, uh, African Americans, Hispanic. But what they're finding is is between men and women in those groups. So it's interesting to follow that data, and it's 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 data they publish every year. What's the disparity? Um, they while the. Across the board, no, the gender disparity. Yeah, there's a there's going. a huge adoption of the tools. They're finding uh, the the women use them very differently than, than the men use them. They're, the women are more likely to engage in an educational event or engage in other ways where the men may not. So that's that's some of the data that's started to come out of their research and stuff. But 
you know, the, the, it's great that they publish that every year because every year it kind of highlights. This is Pew? Yeah. Okay. The Pew American, I'm drawing a blank on. Internet and American Life. Yeah. So we have a few other questions online, uh, one of them being from um, David Stone. And he, it's a question similar to one that I had related to policy. Uh, and that is, the, he said, there are a lot of devices that are available to students with the newer, more generally accessible systems with universal access. It would seem that we could create some sort of standards for the types of interactions that would be well documented and promoted within uh, higher education and or organization like Penn State. And I was thinking with similar lines, what are the policy implications for much of what you're, you're speaking of? Because we know often with adoption, you may have a few thought leaders, a few individuals that are really at the vanguard, but that's very different than pulling everyone along. Sure, absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, herein lies um, kind of the, the need for exploration and research on, on exactly this topic. Uh, because the when we look at these kinds of social environments, there are a number of different aspects of this that, that should give us some pause, but aren't insurmountable challenges. So one is the availability of technology, but the other is not everyone is comfortable engaging socially at this level. Um, and so that's something else we need to kind of think about as we're, we're engaging in these kinds of, of, of environments, is that how, how are students likely to engage in, um, in these conversations? What is their level of anxiety about sharing uh, in, in social um, in, in, in online social environments and whatnot. So, so in, in, you know, anecdotally, I, there are differences depending upon the demographics of the people you're working with. And so that's where our, um, that's the opportunity for exploration. But at the same time, there are really great use cases that are coming out. Um, you know, I, I'm reminded of, of a presentation I saw at the, at the TLT symposium by a, um, about a chemistry course that was at one of the Commonwealth campuses, and the exact one is escaping me, where, but they were using in their chemistry lab this style of, of interaction where they could simultaneously deliver content to the students who are participating as part of this chemistry lab. And they were experimenting in it, it was just with very commodity technology that was kind of universally available. So it wasn't, you didn't have to have a particular phone or device to use it, you could use any number of a range of devices. Um, to, to kind of consume this information. It was being delivered kind of simultaneously inside of the lab. So there are really good kind of use cases that are coming out of this. And so I think part of, of and, and this is uh, hopefully what David was getting at, is really the kind of opportunity in here, which is to document um, and promote these faculty who are being creative in those uses to, and to better understand you know, what does that, that device makeup look like. Or the other part of it is, is that do we need to begin to introduce technology um, to the student as part of doing it in a more global way. So I'm thinking of the mobile media pilot that, that we've been running for the past few years where where faculty are, are the, the um, iPad minis are issued to students inside of the classroom for the uses of creating media inside of those courses. So it's not only using the camera, but then also editing the video um, and sharing and delivering it off of the device itself. These kinds of programs um, can, can help you know, kind of fill in those gaps in terms of it does outfit everyone with the technology, but it also has very specific kind of learning objectives that come along with it. Um, and so those kinds of things can also be, be explored in, in a much broader way. And David actually made another comment similar, related to that, saying that, you know, tablets are so cheap now, it seems like if, it, uh, if we paired with a few courses where we replace a text with university provided resources rather than textbooks, it could help to subsidize that student expense for that course. It certainly, and that's, that uh, goes hand in hand actually with our last discussion topic. So maybe we put that one on pause and then uh, bring it back up at the end. Sure. We, we'll jump back uh, one. We had a question come in after the last topic on credentialing from Neelam asking, uh, referring to the prior discussion on credentials, as far as he understands it, digital badges are used in the context of MOOCs. Learning outcomes are applicable to many modes of learning. So does this discussion focus on the online world, such as World Campus, or does it include MOOCs as well? Uh, is this discussion to improve the processes around World Campus learning outcomes? Uh, I, I would have to say yes, because we're digging down into it, at deeper levels, and it, it kind of cuts across the board in terms of, of hopefully both face-to-face -face online. MOOCs just being another iteration of an online course. Um, 
uh, I don't know, you know, I, um, generally speaking, I, I don't know what level all MOOCs get to in terms of understanding exactly the learning outcomes they want students to get to. Uh, you know, they're so new, it's, it's, they're evolving very quickly, the whole, the whole world around MOOCs is evolving very quickly. Um, as, as people like edX and Coursera and others rethink their their business models and, and kind of next steps forward and and uh, you know it was such an experimentation to begin with that I think now people are really starting to say okay now you know what does this mean and how do we move it forward how does it become part of the fabric of higher education how does it become part of a fabric of informal learning I think there's just a whole host of questions so I, I, I wouldn't I don't know that I want to separate MOOCs out from online because it's just it's another form of online learning. So, so that's and that really speaks to the potential of these kinds of micro credentials. Is it really it's it's learning in all of its forms, right? So whether that be online or in the classroom, or whether that be a part of a, a formalized learning experience or an, or an informal one, whether that be a part of a free and open experience or one that that is is, is highly curricular and structured. You know, any number of different ways that people learn. And that's its potential, is that it, it, it seeks to capture and recognize learning that really historically has not gone recognized. So for students who, who engage in you know, leadership opportunities at their institutions, other than an entry or a line on their resume, there's not really a way to suggest what was the value of that experience, what did they learn from that in a way that could be expressed to other people. Um, because you know, developing that may have specific local value um, that, that, that could be applied in a much greater sense. So uh, there was an example that somebody mentioned to me around Thon, which is, you know, here that has a lot of value. So if you were involved in developing that event, that means something. And But yet outside of this context, you wouldn't necessarily know or understand it because it's not something you're familiar with. So a, a, these kinds of credentials become a way to recognize, okay, participation in this, this is what this means. I mean, this is the size of this event. This is how much money it raised. This is how they participated in the event as a way to kind of share and recognize those kinds of experiences. And so that, that really deals with, like I said, the potential of micro-credentials in a very broad way. So who's involved in this kind of thing from the assessment perspective? Like, because giving a badge is not about completion, it's about mastery. And that it brings, I mean, you brought up prior learning assessment and how that really hasn't been a widely tapped thing at Penn State, although hopefully that's going to expand, but the badging is fundamentally about assessing mastery of a learning outcome. And I think that's been a huge challenge for the MOOCs. It's not just sticking with the MOOC through the end, but actually demonstrating and how, how that, I think it's going to be a really interesting um, approach how we get in those mega classes to assessment when most of our skills are really based on individuals assessing other individuals. There's a lot of peer assessment that's being experimented with but and some automatic grading things that are going on. But that's going to be a huge, huge deal. Your, the value of your badge is going to be based on the value of the assessment. And who does the assessment? Yeah, who does the assessment? <laughs> where it was issued right. from? Yeah, and that's why really the, the value of the badges is, is in everything that supports the badge. So the the the, the, the credential itself is really just kind of a container. Um, right. It's all of the evidence and all the criteria that was met in order to do it. And who was who was doing the assessment is a key part of that. But also, if we look at badges, they they tend to fill in fall under two kind of archetypes, which is those that that is on. Uh, uh, participatory badges, meaning that, that they're largely, um, the, the, the barrier to entry is much lower, they're largely recognizing participation in something in particular. This is something that comes largely from like video games, right? That idea of, okay, I've killed a hundred zombies and as a result I get the zombie killing badge, right? And, and it has a very clear set of, of expectations with it. Whereas there are those that focus on uh, achievement or mastery inside of those spaces. And so I think part of it is to figure out what is the proper mix because each one motivates in a different way and it can have different impacts on how learning takes place and has different expectations um, related to that. And, and so sometimes a, it's not to say that a participatory badge is necessarily a bad thing, mainly because in some cases it could be that the, um, that the assessment is a 
widely held and agreed on assessment of that work and so it's not necessarily relevant who assessed it. So I'm thinking of like when you go and get a, um, you know, let's say a Microsoft certification that the industry has already said, okay, this certification has a certain value. So it's not a matter of how well you earn the certification. It was just that you earned it. Um, and so that's where, um, but then there are other kind of ancillary pieces of when was it learned? You know, the example I always give is, you know, what does it look like to have earned a bachelor's degree in computer science in 1985 versus what it looks like today? You know, certainly some of those principles transfer, but it's not the same thing. And so that's part of what we need to look at is the expiring of these credentials at a micro level. So that, and that has an implication on lifelong learning as well and continuing education. And, and those, you know, we look at, you know, the, the application of these kinds of credentials beyond learning. In some cases, it becomes new business models for the institution to identify, okay, we can see your education and the learning outcomes you met and how you met them. Here are areas where there is new research, there is new learning opportunities in this space that maybe you want to take advantage of. Um, that certainly other, you know, in, 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 in more, um, in, specifically in, in certain professional areas, they already do as part of maintaining a, a current uh, license, but you can begin to apply that same kind of thinking to almost any discipline, um, the, even even if it doesn't have a very specific structured expectation around that. I think there's a, there's a great discussion. I think we, you know, we can come back and revisit some of this as, uh, at the close of our, of our event, but I want to make sure that you have sufficient time to, to make it through the, the broad topics that, that you're hitting today. Sure, sure. So with that, we'll move on to the, the next topic. We really focused on uh, analytics and, and the application of analytics to learning. Um, so really, when we begin to talk about analytics, you know, big data has really become kind of the buzzword that, re, that, that really has driven how people think about these kinds of applications, which is how do we take all of this data that we already have or that we can begin to capture and, draw, and begin to extract insights from that. Right, and, and so it's in the key piece of big data is not necessarily how big your data is, right? And that's really the one of the key arguments is well, sometimes our data sets are much smaller. We're not talking about you know millions of records. We're talking about tens of thousands of records. But at the same time, the principle still holds is that we can learn from this data and, and help use it to help make decisions or use it to help uh, help help our students be more successful. So there are a number of ways that that can happen. One is looking at predictive analytics, which is how do we identify students who are potentially at risk based on a number of factors. And this could be, you know, demographic factors in, co in, in conjunction with factors in terms of how are they interacting with their courses, whether they're online or, or in other ways. Um, and what can we, how can we learn from how those students are interacting in a way to help predict their ultimate success in the course. And so if we can see that, okay, you're on this path of failure or of not doing well, then we can intervene earlier to say, look, this is, you know, you know, this is something you should you should begin for seek help. You know, one of the areas uh, in, in 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 my past work was looking at, you know, one of the um, one of the areas that was really at greatest risk were students who did really well at really weak high schools because they lacked the help seeking behavior of other students because they've never struggled before. They don't know what it looks like to fail and they don't know what, what to do when they are failing. It's just a situation they've never had. So these are students who, are, who otherwise have very high potential that are struggling. And so if we can begin to identify them and say, look, this is what it looks like to fail a class and here's what you do as a result of that is like these are the people you go and talk with your instructor and you seek help in these areas. And, and that becomes an opportunity for helping them improve. And, and there's a lot of research around how, how that can really improve um, or help students be more successful in their courses. And we can also begin to look at other types of things like adaptive learning and, and personalized learning. And, and, but the other one I wanted to touch on, and I think Rick's going to talk about several of these too, which is really looking at how can we begin to apply these concepts to the learning environment itself, to begin to reconfigure the learning environments. One of my past areas of research, research was looking at relevancy which was a really interesting idea, which is how can we begin to identify what is a relevant question? So really help-seeking behavior is this important uh, trait in a successful student. Then how do we help them develop it more at a higher level? And so could we apply these same kind of machine learning techniques to identify relevant questions in a stream of questions? Um, and what we found was, was very interesting was that, that there were a number of indicators of relevance in a question so environments that allowed students to vote on questions 
had absolutely no correlation with the relevance whatsoever. Really, it was a correlation with popularity. Right? So if I put out there a question, can I cancel class next week, that's going to get a lot of votes, even though it's not really relevant to, to the learning process. Right? It kind of makes sense. Um, but what we, did, what we did find that was interesting was that students who asked relevant questions continue to ask relevant questions. And it's probably one of the greatest predictors of relevance is the student who asked it. Uh, and then the other part of that is that you can also use the material of the, of the learning, the lecture, the notes, all these kinds of things that go into it, the presentation. And that, too, can seed a kind of algorithm that can identify relevancy based on the keywords that are used in the question itself, um, which then began, be, begins to open doors to say, OK, well, if we can identify relevant questions, then could we do it preemptively so that as a student's typing in their question, could we help them understand that, look, you're asking what is a question that is, doesn't seem to have relevance in this context? And how do we help them you know, kind of reformulate that in different ways in the same way that you would, um, you know, when you're creating a new account on a website and you have your password strength, right? Oh, that's not a strong password. We know it because based on the makeup of your password. And so we can begin to apply these contexts as the students are asked deeper questions or deeper dive questions. And then also for those questions that have just kind of answers to them, that they just get the answer as opposed to kind of saying, look, you know, can I cancel class week? No, we're not going to cancel class next week. We can get to an answer on that one much quicker, I think. Uh, but all of these look to how do we use these kinds of this kind of data, this kind of machine learning, to begin to apply this and, and create new kinds of environments and, and help our students in new ways. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think you know the, the the biggest thing with the the the, the big data um, conversation is um, finding ways or finding people to help us understand what the data is even telling us mm. because there's so much, <laughs> and I think that's. That's a huge part, and and, and I you know I, I, like Kyle's differentiation between the the predictive analytics and then the 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 what I like to think of as the media analytics, which is the learning analytics. Is how do we, you know, what are going to be those key indicators that let us know within a course that somebody is struggling? And then I think for the institutions, it's a question of okay, we've identified this person now. It, it's just it's one thing to identify them. It's another thing to say we have a system in place that can help you. In other words, um, I'll just you know make this up. Somebody's struggling in a math class. How do we help them step out of that class, get them into something else, into a, in, I, I hate to call it remediation, but but get them into a mode where maybe they have more time to look at these concepts and work in a smaller class or something. But then. The ability to step back in, and I think those are those are kind of the meaty questions: is is what do we, how do we take that data, and actually now formulate plans to help students be successful? And I think it it's going to take institutions kind of rethinking, and, and it kind of goes back to what we were discussing earlier: kind of rethinking what we think of as a class. What do, I mean, does it have to be a fifteen week experience? Can it be something else? Can you know, can we have these these options? I know, you know, another institution I was at, we had devised this this uh, means around math classes, particularly that they could do a math class in the equivalent of a semester, or they could do it across two semesters or three semesters. But they had the ability to step out into these other these other avenues, and it didn't slow down their their advancement towards their degree because they could be taking other courses. But it helped us make it helped us get them to a point where they could be successful. Um, and I think those are those are some of the you know the key things. I, I, we have lots of conversations about what do we do with the data. <laughs> We've got lots of data, and it's it's you know what's even the, what is it even telling us? And I, I think those are the you know some really great uh, questions. And then you know. Kyle kind of talked about the uh, you know the adaptive or the personalized learning aspect is you know how do we take that data and help personalize the experience for the student and what is that again again you know a lot of this is how far can we go because we've got to have the institution help us kind of shift our view of what we think of a class at the same time and what that student experience throughout four years or whatever it is so I think it's going to lead to a lot of interesting conversations as we move forward. Mm -hmm. I think it points on really something to keep in mind in this, because the predictive aspect is really what gets talked about, I think, the most, which is identifying students at risk. 
But there's another aspect, which is the flip side, which is how do we help those students that are actually kind of running into the ceiling? Thus, how do we raise the ceiling uh, for those high-performing students in, in looking at this, not based on kind of a set of measures, but rather on how can a student, how successful can a student be based on their potential or given their opportunity? You know, I'm, I'm reminded of the, 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 um, the president's comments recently related to, you know, if you look at Penn State as a sports car, then how do we get them to drive faster than 20 miles an hour? How do we get them to kind of suck the marrow out of a Penn State education? And I think part of it is that we can begin to identify, you know, students in, in areas with this kind of information and say, clearly this is too easy. Clearly, you know, you, you can do more inside of this environment um, and, and kind of help, help us drive that forward too. And I see that as a real potential opportunity here as well for, um, for, for the use of analytics inside of that space. The risk of analytics, though, is uh, for the use of identifying at-risk students, risk, 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 <laughs> is inadvertently sending the message you don't belong here. And, and I know that the analytics people are aware of these potential issues, but they intersect with student backgrounds and um, experiences in other ways. So if they already feel marginalized, um, then getting some signals that say you're at risk could have a completely unexpected effect of encouraging that student to drop out. Then, like you said, they may be hyper high potential and just need some other things. That's going to be the tricky part of the predictive analytics is how, like you said, how to respond to the data. Not just what it means, what you do with it next and how you communicate something other than at risk, <laughs> but, you know, but in a productive way. Yeah. But, but first we have to, I think, we have to like improve or be sure that the way that we're capturing the analytics like our analytics are correct, right? Mm -hmm. And like we just have to improve the accuracy of our analytics. Like in regards to video analytics, um, you know, you see that a student has watched a video in the online space, the entire length of the video, but no one's there ensuring that the student's looking at his or her screen. Um, I mean, it, it sort of translates to the resident classroom. You know, uh, the professor sees the student come to class and. The student is present in the class watching the video, but you know, are they thinking about the video? Are they zoning out? You know, I mean, it's it, to translate that into the online space. And also, I'm thinking of like, what if a student drops off the video halfway through the video, and we see that as the student watch, didn't watch the entire video, but what if the student picked up an iPad with a different IP address and continued watching that video from the midpoint to the end? So I think the improving the accuracy of how we capture this data and relay it, relate it back to individual students mm -hmm. is like really important for us to do as Penn State. Absolutely, and I, I couldn't agree more, more with that because you know there are, that, that's the key challenge in the entire thing is how do we understand what, what these variables are telling us and applying them um, in, in an ethical way, right? Such that, you know, so, so um, you know, it, it, uh, Purdue, we had a technology called course signal that would give, I mean, it was just a simple red, yellow, green light indicator to the student. And what we found was that really the worst case scenario, even if we had it completely wrong, all that would happen is a conversation between that student and their instructor, right, which is a good thing regardless. But sometimes that was all it took to kind of nudge, nudge that student to do it. And as a result, we would see, um, of course, outcome improvements in the courses. So that's where um, we're part, of, part of really looking at this, what is the ethical application of it? And then what are those indicators? Because there are, you know, those spurious correlations, right? And that's, um, you know, the, 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 my favorite of which is the correlation between drowning and ice cream consumption, right? And there two, the two of them are highly correlative. But the reality is they're not related at all. It's just when it's warm, you go swimming, and you also eat ice cream, and therefore the two have a correlative effect. And so what we need to do is be very careful about these same kinds of things happen, is that in these experiences, um, that, that you know, because they are, you know, we have a collection of students who are engaged in a very common experience, that we can begin to see things like that and, and make sure that we're treating them um, in, in the appropriate way, in a very ethical way. Um, the other part of it is, is that it does, demographics of this type of interaction 
Um, and, and that can mean, in demographic, it isn't just what we mean in terms of you know, uh, age, gender, and, and ethnicity. It can mean many things, like where you went to high school and run your, your SAT and these kinds of things. Begin to suggest something about your learning DNA. This is the things you bring to each learning experience. And how do we learn from that in terms of your own personal learning? Now, what we need to identify, though, is that it's not universally true. So for a student um, who, which, which may have certain demographic characteristics, is it may have absolutely no relevance to their, their ultimate success in terms of predicting that. And that's part of what we need to know and understand is for each of these students, how to understand at that student's level how they're going to interact inside of that case. Not to necessarily say, look, this student's the same as every other student that has this set of characteristics, but rather this student is unique. And what, which of these characteristics are indicative for that particular student in terms of their learning? Um, all that is about probability. Well, yes, certainly. And, and that's why, like I said, we need, to be, we need to be very careful about how we apply uh, that in a very ethical way. Um, because, it, like I said, there, it, it's a complex um, part of how do we inform the student. There's an entire science of the messaging that we use in, in terms of engaging students around this. But at the same time, there's also part of it which deals with if the institution has a, if the institution can know this information about a student, do they have an obligation to know it? Um, which gets kind of complicated as well because we've historically not had this type of information, this kind of data. And once we have it, do we now have an obligation to to to, to share it, even though we may have concerns about how it gets applied? Um, and then there's an entire growth space I I see, which is in what. Can we give the students their own information and allow them to extract their own value from it? So in the same way that you might wear a Fitbit or something like that, based on your own kind of personal exercise and these kinds of things, and it suggests something about it means something to you directly, can we give students their own learning data from which they can extract their own insights based on things that, that are meaningful to them? What is the kind of Fitbit for learning style of, yeah. of thinking? That sounds a lot more ethical. <laughs> there was a really good article in the the last couple of days called Who Are You Calling Under Privilege? Which really addresses that that sort of issue of I fit into this, I've been categorized as this, but I don't think I belong in it. And really powerful short article I would recommend it. So just to kind of continue moving this along, our last area, and, and we'll cover this one I, I would think fairly quickly, although it's a very kind of broad topic, is really looking at content in terms of what we mean to be content um, and, and really the space around that. So really we're seeing a shifting of this in terms of it's no longer just the text based or the video based, con or video based content, but also the conversations, the social connections that begin to emerge around this content. Um, but really one of the areas that is, is interesting is, is the growth in OER, right? So the open educational resource or open learning modules, however you want to kind of describe that, these are free and openly available pieces of content that allow us to begin to liberate textbooks from classes. And I've always kind of liked that idea that, that it's, it's something that needs to be drawn out of the classroom and, and really thought about in a very different way. And if for no other reason than their cost, right? So the, the average cost of the textbook has continued, continued to rise over the years. Um, if, it, if we look at students at you know, community colleges in general, the cost of your textbooks can be equal to or more than the cost of your tuition. Um, so really, this is a real problem that needs to be dealt with. Uh, and so part of that is through thinking through what are new business models around textbooks? Um, because really, the you know, approaches to date around e-text, the kind of promise of e-text driving down the cost of text, hasn't really materialized in a meaningful way. What we're seeing is, is marginal savings in some cases. But really, if we look at a, a textbook that went from you know, $150 down to $80, it's still an $80 textbook, right? It's still expensive. Even though we want to look at, well, we had a sizable you know, percentage reduction, it's still a very expensive piece of media. So how do we get that down to uh, a number that's approaching free? Um, and because part of it is, and that's where I think the, the struggle is, is that we can't look at this in free content because free tends to be a really bad business model, right? That you really can't sustain something that's free without somebody subsidizing it, uh, whether that be the instructor subsidizing it, whether that be the institution or the department subsidizing that. So what we need to think about are what are new business models around content? 
where we can get it to, to a number that's approaching free, but yet provide kind of rich content that's very timely, right? That's another opportunity that we have here, which is all of these things that happen on campus that we can draw in and share with our students as part of these experiences that are happening as, as um, you know, while kind of life proceeds. You know, I, I'm reminded of, of a professor I worked with a number of years ago who's t who taught veterinary science and yet when she shared with her students, she could pick from any set of, you know, MRIs from different animals, but you couldn't, she, you know, no textbook publisher had the MRIs of the, of, the, of the injured dog that was in the clinic down the hall that you could actually go and see and touch. And to be able to use that kind of material as part of the learning in that classroom um, to try and reinforce some of those ideas was an opportunity that was, that, that needed, you know, it needed a platform, it needed a business model in order to kind of make that work. And so, and that exists in so many different disciplines. There are so many things that go on that how do we take what's happening now and draw it into those learning experiences? And so that's where we look at kind of the opportunities around learning content from that space. And I think, you know, one, one of the things that we're um, exploring in, in, in more kind of in the online world at the moment is um, kind of rethinking what a course even is. And, and so that idea is, you know, can we and again, it gets that level of course and level of learner, whether they're novice learner, expert learner, depending on, on, on how we define those. But can we move away from the actual presentation of content and develop experiences that are motivational to where students go out and kind of ties back to what Kyle was saying about you know open education resources, but they go out and find their own, they find the information. They go out and explore all these different avenues and they're solving, we, we've kind of, we kind of set up meaty problems for them and get them motivated, but we're not presenting content in the traditional way of presenting content. And it's, it's like I said, we're very exploratory. We're trying to understand what that would look like. We're trying to understand, you know, is that something you can do at the graduate level, but not the undergraduate level? You know, where, where can we, where can we do it? Uh, does it make sense? But it's it's kind of trying to break the mold of, of how we think of courses. I just need mold. to think, realize that this kind of conversation has been going on for 30 years outside of technology. I think technology might enable that, but problem-based learning has been around for at least 30 right. years. And, and, and not based. lecturing has been around for right. at least that long as well. So, But in the online world, we tend to still kind of present the content in we, text form, in text or, form, in video text form or whatever. This so is a huge concern of mine about the flipped classroom. It's so popular now that we're reverting to lecture, even though we know lecture isn't necessarily the best way for most students to learn. It's just a, it's a really bizarre thing to watch. You know, flipped classroom is new and it's like, not really. <laughs> it just has technology now. And I do worry about, you know, that we're going back to talking heads yeah. when we know from the active learning research literature. And I, and I think, you know, in, in all cases, we, we um, use problem-based learning or case-based in narrow ways in courses. And what we're trying to think is how do we, how do we take that model and make it core. The, the core? And uh, so, yeah, I mean, a lot of things are very cyclical and <laughs> come around us <laughs> from, from you, over the years. Um, but I think, you know, we're at this point where technology is going to allow us to, to look at it a little differently mm -hmm. and think yeah. a little differently about some of these things than, than we have in the past. So. So, and so part of it is to rethink, you know, the, um, so what, how do we define content? And that's what technology has changed, is that it's not, it's no longer what can just be put into a, a, a printed media, but rather all the things that surround it. Um, and, and also, too, is the distribution model has fundamentally changed as well, and technology made that possible. I, you know, I'm reminding of, of you know, the, the process that used, you know, involved in, in what it used to mean to buy a piece of software, right? You would go to, you know, a place like Best Buy, you would walk up and down an aisle, you'd buy a box that was you know, mostly air that had a disk inside, and you'd go home and you'd spend your afternoon trying to install it, right? <laughs> and so, but, you know, apps changed all of that. I can you know, download, install an app and apply a coupon and the tie it takes to order a burrito, right? And, and do it right there. Um, and it's going to work. And, and in reality, rather than paying the 40 or $50 software I was paying before, now I'm paying, what, a dollar? 
or maybe it's it's usually free, or maybe I'm spending two dollars if I'm a real high roller. You know, I'm gonna buy a two dollar app. Um, and all of this changed because what happened was is that the the value chain inverted on the software, which was we were beginning to value the software and not its distribution. And the same thing's happening with 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 tech or with learning content, which is we're valuing the creation, we're valuing the content, we're putting less of an emphasis on its distribution. So as a result, we're no longer putting it into the media that needs a distributor to deliver that for me. We now have any number of medias, uh, mediums from which I can deliver my own content. And that creates then the opportunity to say, OK, couple that with the fact that it's much easier to create content today, like the example I was giving before, where students were using iPads to create video in the classroom. right? Um, so these kinds of ideas that we can quickly create the media. And then we also have the tools to have the conversations uh, that surround them. And so I think that's part of what, what's happened is that shift is that we have changed the distribution model. And that then gives us these new, this new potential. That links up very, very well with the question that David Stone has online. But before we go to that, we are running over. It's 11.41. I want to make certain that, that the two of you don't need to be somewhere right now. Oh, uh, I'm good to go. OK, yes. then we'll do it. I watch Daily Show quite a bit, and we'll throw it up on the web. So uh, <laughs> anyone who does have to leave us early, uh, we'll have a recording of this session online. You can you can view it there and, and find the questions, these questions, the answers to these questions. So connected with what uh, David Stone was saying, and somewhat what you were just saying with apps and what they've done to software, it's somewhat the opposite when it comes to educational content, where content is very open and available now. There's a lot of it. And David's initial question was, is that reducing the value of the content and perhaps shifting the value proposition to aggregators of content or miners of content to be able to find the best and most appropriate content rather than on the content itself? I think it, it, it changes. I don't know that it changes the value of the content. What it does is it puts an emphasis um, on us as educators to help students understand what is valued content versus what isn't. I think you know, I, it, there's been some some studies recently talking about you know the new digital literacy is not so much about do I have a computer or do I know how to work with technology. It's it's, it's how do I do I know how to discern all the information that's coming at me is kind of the new digital. So I think, I don't know, you know, uh, you can have a lot of valuable content out there, a lot of great contributors, and you can have a lot of content that's not very good. And the question is, you know, how do we help students understand the difference? Well, it seems like with that problem, you're just shifting the value of the distributor in the old model with the value of a curator in, in this model. So mm -hmm. it, it's not the content that changes. So in my opinion, it's it's how you're getting that content. Mm -hmm. So it's shifting from a, a Pearson or, or a publisher like that to a Google or, or something of that sort. But Mike, to follow up on, on, on your comment, do you, I mean, um, do you see the individual becoming the curator? Well, so in our world, it, it seems like, like if you create the individual as the curator, you have to train them to be a good curator. So I, I know in um, just my undergraduate education where uh, it was based on problem-based learning, a lot of the learning experience was, uh, over the years, was to teach you to be a good curator. Mm -hmm. So it was um, how to poke holes in the content where it doesn't make sense and ask questions. So it was more around those things. It's, it's known as critical thinking skills, mm -hmm. which is very vague, and, but, but I think that judgment is something we all hope that our students learn at the end of whatever level of course it is. So. Yeah, I think, and, and that's where, you know, David kind of brought up a really interesting concept here around kind of the economy of content, mm -hmm. meaning that if, if, if before, if, you know, let's say, you know, 10 years ago, we had a scarcity in content, so we highly valued it. Now, with there being a proliferation of content, then does its value become, you know, is it reduced as a result? Because there aren't only a fixed number of people creating it now. Really, anybody can create it and put it out there. And so that then gives rise to new industries around curation, around delivery, around distribution. Uh, and that's
that's why I say kind of feeding back to, to my original, I think that's the need for a new business model, which was our old business model of I'm a publisher, I publish content, and you, there's a premium paid for that. We need to move away from that to get to a more micro model like we do with the applications with apps now, where we say, okay, we can look at very specific uh, value points based on the creator and begin to value them and let the market kind of shake that out. So I think we'll, we'll jump to our last question that was uh, posed online here from, uh, from Barb Purcell asking, how might MOOCs fit into the content pipeline for institutions? Will, for example, specific faculty members uh, that have exceptional content in a MOOC start to be recognized as the de facto expert on veterinary science, for example? Will vet science curriculums then start to leverage this content across institutions? That's, that's certainly the potential of the MOOC, right, is to begin to elevate um, you know, the, the availability of this kind of content. Uh, but then also, in so doing, raise uh, the brand of the institution and the personal brand of the faculty who create it, which then kind of reinforces the instructional brand uh, of the institution. And so that's where there are a number of kind of variables that are, are have a number of positive influences that can have um, through that. And so, but yet that's kind of the open question on MOOCs, right, is that can we get to that point? In some cases, you know, we begin to see that, that, that faculty who are you know, well-known in a particular area can generate a, a large following of people to kind of engage in those courses. But then part of what we need to see is, is how do we get to this point that, that Bart's describing here where this content now exists, how do we get it to proliferate? And in so doing, then carry with it the state brand. Um, so that when you're learning about this topic at another institution, that it's branded material. So rather than it being branded with Pearson or McGraw-Hill or whoever, it's now branded with Penn State and linked back to kind of the credibility that we can apply to it. And that's, I think, part of the real opportunity with MOOCs, but part of it is it's yet to be seen if we can get to that point. Certainly, you know, it's, it's certainly uh, possible. That was the whole promise of edX with Harvard. They said, we're Harvard. People want to see our faculty. And I'd really like to see some data that show that that's actually happening. There, the recent MOOCs that were approved did have some interesting ideas for how to track that. So it'll be interesting to see if that does happen. Because they're pretty expensive. There better be a return. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I think since we're uh, almost 20 minutes over now, I think I'll, I'll relieve you to go on to your next thing. Now, I want to thank everyone, both our virtual attendees and those of you who are here in person for a great and engaging discussion. And usually, I don't take the opportunity to do this, but I also want to, to plug a few things. Uh, if you want us uh, to see the uh, questions and answers uh, throughout this session and, and hear the dialogue or share it with those who had to leave us early, this will be up on our website, coil.psu.edu, soon. And also there, you will see a registration for an upcoming speaker we have who uh, we just ended talking about edX. The uh, president of edX, CEO of edX, will be uh, presenting here in, in a few weeks. Anant Agahal, you may have uh, seen his TED talk. He'll be coming in for a Coil Fisher speaker uh, series uh, discussion in, on June 13th. Uh, that is a closed registration, so unlike most of our events, you can't just walk into this one. Uh, so I direct you to our website to do that. And you can also see all of our other upcoming events there as well. So with that, thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Rick. Thank you for all of our participants. And we will see you at the next Coil conversation. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks. It's good.